Previously on Tales of the Hunger Games, Selina Brax and Lazarus Dalton, nephew of Ennius Dalton, fought hard for the role of District 2's tributes in the 99th Hunger Games. Although Selina was somewhat unhappy with their mentor, Rubius Dalton, she built a strong relationship with their stylist, Ariadne Fling. Furthermore, both she and Lazarus made strong impressions on capital citizens and their fellow career tributes in the days before the games. However, when the games began, Lazarus was at least partly responsible for the deaths of both Treasure and Pearl from District 1, which seemed to unsettle Selina to some degree. After a first day that featured a record-breaking 15 fallen tributes, a blackout occurred within the arena during the early afternoon of the second day, although this very much played in the favour of Selina and Lazarus, who were the only tributes to possess night vision goggles. The pair had travelled south from the cornucopia with no success, until Selina believed to see something through the darkness on the other side of a nearby stream. Selina quietly asked Lazarus to come over, and once he was with her, she asked if the marks that she could see looked like footprints. Lazarus took a close look and nodded, stating that he believed they were. He became excited, and said that they looked recent, before grabbing his supplies and insisting that they follow them. As the pair began to follow the footprints, Eugenia reminded viewers that they had indeed been left by Skye from 14 and Jackson and Cleanser both from 12, shortly before the blackout was triggered, and that this group had only travelled a few hundred metres before they rested in the darkness by another stream. Lazarus quietly walked ahead of Selina, and they slowly headed up the hill between the trees. After five minutes, Lazarus suddenly put his hand up towards Selina, before pointing through the trees to his west, where he had spotted this trio, who were quietly discussing where they should head after the blackout. Lazarus and Selina very carefully approached, being careful not to tread on anything that could make a sound. When they were only ten minutes away, Selina tapped Lazarus's shoulder and signed that she had a clear shot at Jackson, who was visible between the trees ahead. Lazarus nodded back, signing that he would travel around the side and stab the girls with his sword. As he carefully crept in this direction, Selina pulled back her arrow, although before he had reached swiping distance, Selina heard Cleanser asking her allies if they had heard something, at which point she let the arrow fly. Jackson's cannon sounded just a second later when the arrow hit his head. Cleanser and Skye screamed in unison, and they tried to get to their feet, but Cleanser swiftly tripped over and fell, which allowed Lazarus to run towards her and stab her through the heart with his sword. He then swiped at Skye, but she narrowly avoided his sword by throwing herself back, and the blade was lodged in a tree. Selina ran towards this action as Lazarus grabbed Skye by the jacket, but she quickly pulled her arms from the sleeves, and despite not appearing able to see through the darkness, she managed to run between the trees to her east. Lazarus immediately ran after Skye as Selina followed, but despite impressing capital viewers to some degree with her navigation through the darkness, she eventually ran straight into a tree, before falling to the ground in pain. Skye tried to get up, but Lazarus immediately picked her up by the scruff of her neck. She blindly waved her arms around and desperately tried to free herself from Lazarus's grip, as she let out a string of swear words, but he punched her in the face, and she fell back against a tree. As Selina finally arrived behind Lazarus, he picked up Skye by the neck, whilst growling, Did you really think you would stop me? Before she could even answer, Lazarus thrust the back of her head through a jagged branch on a neighbouring tree, and as this branch came out through Skye's mouth, her cannon sounded. Selina immediately turned away in apparent disgust, as Lazarus grinned and broke off the branch. Whilst the hovercraft came in to collect these bodies, she whispered in a daze that she was going to see if the group had left any supplies where they were resting, and Lazarus nodded as he pretended to nod Skye's head in approval, which made Selina shudder as she walked away. When Selina reached their original location, Jackson and Cleanser's bodies were being removed. She gagged in disgust as she looked at the food and drink that this group had collected, before crying and quietly whispering that it was not supposed to be like this. However, over the next minute, the light returned to the arena, and as Selina heard Lazarus returning, she washed her mouth out with water and wiped away her tears. When Lazarus reached Selina, he said that they had done brilliantly, and she gave him a nod and weak smile as they put their goggles back into their bags. For the rest of the afternoon, the pair headed anti-clockwise, through the southern, then southeastern, then eastern outer sectors. They almost found Litz and Radia both from three when they entered the eastern sector, but Radia heard them coming, which allowed her and Litz to hide themselves in time beneath the surface of a large lake. Selina and Lazarus failed to find any other tributes that afternoon, but Lazarus seemed less annoyed about this than the day before. 
explaining that there were only five left, which was indeed true. Selina agreed, but Eugenia commented that it was obvious how overwhelmed she now was from the event since she had entered the arena, with Ennius claiming that he had expected more from her. As the darkness of the early evening set in, Selina suggested heading back to the cornucopia, and although Lazarus was at first opposed to this suggestion, he soon changed his mind when Selina reminded him that someone could potentially have taken all their supplies. They travelled west with their weapons at the ready, whilst looking around at all angles through the moonlit woods with the help of their night vision goggles. When they had completed almost half their journey, Lazarus said that he needed some water, and so after spotting a stream almost a hundred metres to the south, he went to fill his bottle while Selina rested. Once Lazarus was out of earshot, Selina appeared to cry and breathed deeply, until she heard a voice above her quietly asking if she felt alright. Selina immediately grabbed her bow and pointed an arrow upwards, to where she saw Garrick from Seven lying on a thick branch of the tree, almost ten metres above the ground. Selina breathed out in disbelief, but he whispered that he was sorry for startling her. She continually looked between the arrow in her bow and the faint outline of Garrick, with an expression that made Eugenia laugh as she said that she loved it when this sort of thing happens. Selina slowly lowered her bow and looked around for Lazarus, but he was still filling his bottle. In an agitated tone, she whispered to ask Garrick what he was doing, and he responded that it was nice to see her too, which made Selina look back at him with a slightly amused exasperation. Garrick then stated that they did not have much time, but as she had not yet killed him, he would help her. Selina was clearly intrigued as she continued to look up at Garrick, but he continued that the threes have electrocuted your wires. Selina immediately asked what this meant, but he said that whilst he did not know, he had heard them talking about the cornucopia wires as they walked beneath him during the blackout. Selina appeared suspicious, but before she could respond, Garrick asked if he could have some food. Ennius stated that he was a cheeky bugger, but Garrick said that as he had helped Selina, she could help him. Viewers in Snow Square laughed at his nerve to ask a career for food, but remarkably, Selina proceeded to take some bread from her bag and place it at the bottom of the tree. Garrick quietly thanked her, and she let out an ironic smile, but at that moment, she heard Lazarus coming back towards her, and so she swiftly turned around. As Lazarus approached Selina, he asked if everything was well, and she led him west, away from the tree, whilst responding that everything was indeed well. For the next hour, they continued back to the cornucopia, arriving two hours before midnight. It was noticed during this time that Selina was looking very avidly around the clearing, but when Lazarus said that he was hungry and he walked towards the cornucopia, Selina suddenly darted her gaze towards him. Viewers in Snow Square sounded excited, although many were shouting at Lazarus to not touch the wires that lay across the mouth of the structure. Selina suddenly told him to stop moving. He did so, but asked her why, and she examined the wires carefully. Lazarus asked what was wrong, but just as Selina was looking at where the wires touched the side of the cornucopia, she appeared to spot a battery that had indeed been attached to the lowest wire by Litz earlier that day, which made her raise her eyebrows in surprise. As Selina showed this to Lazarus, he became very angry, and yelled that the vault monkeys were trying to kill him, before marching around to the front of the cornucopia and throwing his sword, which broke through the wires and allowed them to enter for their supplies. Over the next two hours, the pair ate, and Lazarus spoke in a critical manner about the audacity of the other tributes, Selina replied that in all fairness, she and Lazarus had also been trying to kill them, which he seemed to accept, although he maintained that the electrocution of the wires was extremely cowardly. Later in the discussion, Lazarus said that they should kill at least three of the others the next day, and aim for Litz and Radio first. Selina passively agreed, and she took the first watch when Lazarus headed to the inside of the cornucopia for sleep. An hour later, Horn of Plenty played, and the portraits of Watusi from Ten, Jackson and Cleanser, both from 12, and Sky from 14 were all shown, which left only seven tributes remaining. Lazarus and Selina, both from 2, Litz and Radia, both from 3, Marinella from 4, Phoenix from 6, and Garrick from 7. As the sun rose the next morning, Selina was awoken in the cornucopia by a metallic clanging, that she rolled over to see was being caused by Lazarus, who was throwing knives against a set of targets on the opposite wall. Selina sarcastically joked that this was not the most pleasant wake-up call that she had ever had, but Lazarus responded that he could have stabbed her instead. She glanced at him with a slightly worried expression, 
but he grinned and said that he was joking. Selina breathed out and took some food from the pile for both herself and Lazarus, which they proceeded to eat. During this meal, Lazarus suggested heading north, as this was where he believed Litz and Radia to be, and Selina appeared content to go along with this plan. Yet just as they finished eating and were about to place the wires across the mouth of the cornucopia, Gamemaker Breen suddenly announced to the arena that a feast would be held in the cornucopia clearing in half an hour, before wishing that the odds be in the tribute's favour and ending the announcement. Lazarus immediately gasped with joy and grinned at Selina. He quickly inspected the area just in front of the cornucopia's mouth, and after carefully inspecting the grass, stated that the feast platform would rise just a few metres in front of the structure. Selina suggested that before the feast began, they could hide within the cornucopia, which might fool the other tributes into thinking that it was safe to enter, and hence make it easier for her and Lazarus to target them when they ran in. Lazarus quickly accepted this idea, and they grabbed all their supplies that lay outside of the cornucopia, which they placed against the back wall inside the structure. They spent the next 20 minutes waiting patiently, whilst carefully eyeing the feast table in front of the cornucopia, until it finally rose from the ground with the five bags ready for the taking. Lazarus stood against the back of the western wall and held one of his knives at the ready, while Selina stood against the back of the eastern wall with an arrow ready in her bow. For the next two minutes they stood almost completely still, with their eyes focused intently on the feast platform ahead, until Radia suddenly sprinted in from the east. Lazarus threw his knife and Radia fell against the feast table as it hit her chest. She gasped at the presence of Lazarus and Selina, whilst the former grabbed his sword and ran towards her. Selina then ran out from the eastern side of the cornucopia to see Litz to the east, and he was clearly panicked and ready to flee. Lazarus continually stabbed Radia with his sword, which prompted Litz to run backwards, but before he could even turn away from Selina, he saw her giving a bittersweet smile before firing an arrow at his heart. Litz was hit, and as Radia's cannon sounded, he fell to the ground. Lazarus swiftly cast his eye over the forest surrounding the western side of the clearing, while Selina walked over to Litz, whose breathing was slowing, but before she had even reached him, his cannon sounded. Lazarus and Selina quickly regrouped by the feast table, whilst continually looking around for other tributes, but they failed to see any of those that were hiding. Three minutes went by, and Lazarus even seemed rather irritated when no more tributes entered the clearing. However, the dome timer suddenly appeared in the centre of the arena's roof, which began to count down from two minutes. Lazarus appeared excited, and he and Selina returned to the feast table, whilst looking around in all directions for other tributes. Yet as the first minute went by with no more action, Lazarus gradually began to look up towards Selina with a rather menacing grin as he gripped his sword, and Ennius remarked that maybe they were about to get some more action. Lazarus looked ready to approach Selina, but she coincidentally turned back towards him and shrugged at the lack of other visible tributes. When only a minute remained on the dome timer, he opened their feast bag, and they were clearly pleased to see that it contained two sets of body armour. Lazarus asked Selina to take out the sets of armour whilst he defended the platform. She pulled out the first as she looked towards the east of the clearing, but she did not appear to notice that Lazarus was slowly pulling his sword into the air behind her. The crowds in Snow Square gasped, but just as Lazarus appeared ready to behead Selina, an axe suddenly sliced across the top of his right shoulder. Selina jolted around as Lazarus yelped in pain, before gasping when she appeared to realise that he had been about to kill her. She was then equally shocked to see Garrick, who had just thrown this axe from behind the western side of the cornucopia. Lazarus fell to his knees and thrust his sword towards the side of Selina's leg, but she quickly kicked his face before he managed this, which offset his balance and caused the sword to merely scrape the side of her leg. Meanwhile, Garrick was running towards Selina, and he shouted at her to grab their bags as Lazarus snatched his throwing knife from the table and turned towards Selina. She narrowly dodged the first knife and grabbed both the bags for District 2 and District 7, before throwing herself on the other side of the table, whilst Garrick beckoned Lazarus to throw a knife at him. As Selina proceeded to run north with these bags, Lazarus, who was still on his knees, threw a knife at Garrick, but he swiftly ducked and hence avoided this knife that would have hit his face. Lazarus shouted in anger as Garrick ran to the north, past the western side of the cornucopia, and Selina ran in the same direction, past the eastern side. As the dome timer reached zero and the feast table lowered back down into the ground, Lazarus yelled in anger whilst glaring at the wound on his shoulder and snarling in pain. During this time, Garrick followed Selina through the northeastern forest, but as they reached the nearest stream, 
He seemed surprised when she suddenly readied her bow and pointed an arrow straight at him. Garrick asked what Selina was doing, to which she swiftly asked him the same question. He appeared taken back, but said that he really liked her. Yet before he could elaborate, Selina told him to cut the crap and tell her what he was really up to. Garrick breathed out and nodded as Selina kept the arrow at the ready. He then told her that before the games, he realised that he would only have a chance of victory with a strong ally, before rhetorically asking Selina if they were not stronger together after what had just happened with Lazarus. Selina looked at Garrick sceptically, but slowly lowered her arrow. He then added that he also had a thing for redheads, and Selina raised her eyebrows, but continued to lower her arrow as Garrick grinned and asked if he could have his feast bag. Selina handed it to him, then took off her jacket and put the armour over her torso, whilst he opened his bag to find some bread and cheese. After noticing Garrick eyeing the other set of armour, Selina casually replied that she wanted some of his food as well, and he contently nodded in agreement, whilst breaking off some bread for them both as Selina threw the other set of armour at his feet. Yet after hearing Lazarus yelling from the cornucopia clearing, and then seeing the hovercraft through the trees, Selina said that they needed to move before Lazarus found them, and so they swiftly continued northeast, across the streams and through the forests for the rest of the morning. Meanwhile, Lazarus had not moved from the cornucopia during this time. He gradually got to his feet and painfully examined his wound, before yelling for a bandage as the hovercraft entered to collect radia and lits his bodies. Shortly after they were removed, a bandage and medication for pain relief both arrived from sponsors. It was also noted by Eugenio that there had not been many sponsor gifts so far this year, with Ennius joking that the capital wanted to see a more natural game. Lazarus swiftly applied this bandage and consumed the medication, which did indeed appear to ease his pain after a while. He moved the contents of the remaining feast bags into the cornucopia once more, then practiced throwing his knives at the targets for the rest of the morning, whilst regularly checking on his wound and grumbling about Selina and the tree boy. Over this morning, Selina and Garrick quietly discussed what they had seen so far in the arena, occasionally stopping when they wanted a rest or when they thought that they had seen one of the other tributes. Eventually, the pair reached a large lake that lay a few hundred metres ahead of the perimeter. Selina remarked that she could see large fish in this lake, adding that she had been surprised by the lack of animals in the arena, to which Garrick replied that there were fish in the other perimeter lakes that he had seen. Whilst they ate by this lake, Selina hypothesised that if Lazarus had followed them, he would have attacked them by now, before correctly theorising that he had remained by the cornucopia. Neither she nor Garrick had any idea about Phoenix, who viewers were watching as she finally moved herself from her camouflaged position by the stream in the western sector, where she now appeared to be looking for food. However, as they discussed Marinella, Garrick stated that he had seen her in the eastern sector, and Selina correctly guessed that as she was from District 4, she would likely be by one of the lakes, as they contained fish. Garrick suggested that they continued clockwise around the perimeter after this meal, and Selina agreed. When she had finished, she proceeded to shoot her arrows at a target on a nearby tree, and Garrick appeared impressed by her accuracy. As midday passed, the pair walked clockwise around the edge of the arena, checking any lakes that they could find and passing through the rest of the northeastern sector, then into the eastern sector. Garrick was annoyed to have initially lost his only axe to Lazarus, but he managed to break off a heavy yet compact branch of a tree that he continued to hold in front of him in a defensive manner. Garrick and Selina did not speak to each other much during this time, as they appeared to not want Marinella to hear them approaching a lake where she may be resting. However, they worked well together, and quietly communicated using what seemed to be their own form of sign language. A few hours after midday, Selina suddenly stopped Garrick, when she realised that she could hear splashing in a lake that was less than 100 metres ahead, which viewers had seen to be caused by Marinella as she tried to catch the fish, with some in Snow Square shouting at her to run, whilst others excitedly waited for the action that would ensue. Garrick and Selina slowly and carefully navigated their way south through the trees towards this sound. However, Selina whispered that this could be a trap, and so she and Garrick held their respective weapons firmly at the ready as they approached. Eugenia noted that Selina was wisely looking up through the trees every few seconds as they walked, possibly for any awaiting tributes, but fortunately for her and Garrick, there were none. Just over two minutes later, they rested behind a tree where they had a clear view of Marinella, who was eating a fish that she had just caught. Selina signed to Garrick that she would shoot Marinella, and she readied her arrow in the bow from behind the tree, whilst Marinella appeared oblivious to the danger that she was in. Selina watched her eating the fish in an apparent daze, 
and Eugenia stated that although Marinella was about to die, she had done better than many expected, especially given that she was the only 12-year-old tribute in this year's lineup. Selena let the arrow fly and it hit Marinella's heart, sounding her cannon before she had even hit the ground. Selena and Garrick quickly approached her, and whilst Garrick looked through Marinella's pockets, Selena looked around at the surprisingly detailed drawings that Marinella had sculpted into the mud with a stick over the last two days. As Selena continued to walk through the trees and look at these pictures, she appeared lost for words, until she saw a note that had been carved onto a tree the night before, in which Marinella had written that she loved her family, and that she hoped she had made them proud. Aeneas rolled his eyes as a tear appeared to form in Selena's eye, but she began to audibly cry when she saw the bottom of this paragraph, in which Marinella had told her family to let Baby know that she would always be its big sister, in reference to the unborn child of Marinella's pregnant mother at the time. Selina leaned against the tree behind her, and gasped for breath as tears streamed down her face. Garrick quickly ran over, seemingly thinking that Selina was hurt, but she gripped onto him, before crouching down on the floor and sobbing that these were real people. Garrick slowly rubbed Selina's back as she recounted how the training academies had always taught them to see the tributes from other districts as wild animals. Garrick listened intently as she went into more detail about what happened within these academies, stating that they had always been prepared for hunting and killing others, but not for whatever comes after. As Selina continued to cry and have trouble breathing, Aeneas noted that she was having madness of the mind, and the action swiftly cut back to Lazarus, who was still in the cornucopia, where he had been guarding the supplies and practicing spear throwing for most of the day. As the darkness of night set in, so did a wave of rain, at first light, but then heavy. Lazarus consumed some bread and water before practicing with his throwing knives this time, all within the shelter of the cornucopia. He occasionally looked out through the impending darkness that was settling over the clearing, but did not see anyone, and so he simply carried on practicing his aim with the knives. Yet just as it became fully dark and Lazarus placed his night vision goggles over his eyes, he heard a loud scream from the south of the clearing, which immediately piqued his interest. Viewers had seen that Phoenix, who was now clearly starving, had carefully made her way east towards the cornucopia. After reaching the edge of the clearing, she heard Lazarus throwing his knives, and she proceeded to walk anti-clockwise around the clearing, eventually arriving at its southern edge, where she appeared just about capable of seeing Lazarus, at which point she screamed. As Phoenix ran to the east, Aeneas joked that this was the oldest trick in the book, and Lazarus quickly armed himself with his knives. He walked out of the cornucopia, but stood only a few metres in front of the structure, with his goggles helping him see through the edge of the clearing, although he did not appear to have spotted Phoenix, who had just run into the southeastern forest by the clearing. She then screamed in a slightly different pitch, but it proceeded to run clockwise, back in the direction that she had just travelled. Lazarus gradually walked towards the southeast of the clearing, in the direction that he had heard the scream, but he stopped when he was halfway between the edge of the clearing and the cornucopia, whilst Phoenix ran through the southwestern sector of the forest. Two minutes went by as Lazarus stood still, and looked carefully into the south and southeastern sectors of the forest, whilst occasionally looking back towards the cornucopia, until Phoenix quickly emerged from the north of the clearing, where she ran in behind the cornucopia. She rested on the outside of its western wall, from which she very carefully watched Lazarus, as he in turn looked towards the southern edge of the clearing. Yet as he looked back once more, Phoenix quickly ducked behind the wall, and he failed to see her. Lazarus then sidestepped to his left, towards the eastern forest, as she sprinted out from behind the wall and into the cornucopia. Phoenix swiftly grabbed a bag of bread and fruit whilst Lazarus continued to look intently into the southern forest. Phoenix was about to run back the way she had come, but upon noticing an array of weapons that lay next to these supplies, she hesitated and grabbed an axe. However, as she picked it up, its blade grinded against the wall, and Lazarus jolted around. Phoenix panicked as Lazarus shouted and sprinted towards her. She then ran to her west, and he chased after her, but she soon seemed to realise that she could not outrun him, and she turned around in desperation. Lazarus roared at Phoenix, and he threw a knife at her chest. But amazingly, she managed to deflect this weapon with the axe that she had just taken, and it flew off to the right. As Lazarus advanced towards Phoenix, she seemed to panic, and simply threw her axe at his legs. Although Lazarus easily managed to jump over this axe as he ran ahead, he landed uncomfortably on his right ankle, which caused him to swear and almost trip. He then furiously threw another knife, which hit Phoenix in the stomach, and she fell to her knees. Lazarus readied another knife, and told Phoenix how he was about to kill her. 
Although she still had a knife in her stomach and was clearly in pain, she let out a weak smile as Lazarus hobbled towards her, with Eugenia guessing that she was laughing at the way he was walking. Yet when Lazarus was within just metres of Phoenix, she removed the knife from her stomach and grinned once more, before stabbing herself in the neck, with Lazarus swiftly branding her a coward when her cannon sounded seconds later. Meanwhile, as the darkness and rain had set in, Selina and Garrick continued to travel clockwise adjacent to the perimeter. During this time, Garrick listened to Selina as she spoke in detail about the Dalton elite and the different ways she had practiced killing. Garrick appeared fascinated, but also somewhat disturbed, by what Selina told him. The pair were almost at the centre of the southeastern sector when they decided to rest for the night by the nearest lake. They ate some of their bread and drank some water from the lake, before huddling together for warmth amidst the cold temperatures and winds that were now prevalent throughout the arena. After a few minutes, Garrick was delighted to be sent a box of matches by sponsors, although Selina stated that these would be useless without logs. However, Garrick quickly managed to rip some branches from the nearest trees, claiming that they often did this back home, when they had run out of chopped wood. He and Selina piled these branches together beneath a large overhanging tree that was able to shield them from most of the falling rain, and within a few minutes, Garrick used the matches to begin a fire, next to which he and Selina proceeded to sit. He then told her about life in District 7, and how he claimed to have known that he and Esther would never win, but that he would at least want to go out in style and die a memorable death if he had to. Selina smiled sympathetically, before reaching out and running her hand through Garrick's hair. He stopped talking and looked at Selina in wonder as she asked if he had a girl back home. He quickly shook his head, and a second later, Selina moved in to kiss him. Over the next few minutes, she and Garrick gradually removed their clothes and the cameras continuously switched between Phoenix's attempt to steal from Lazarus and Selina and Garrick's intimacy, with many viewers in Snow Square shouting for the focus of the camera to be changed, depending on their preferences. Phoenix's cannon subsequently sounded, but whilst Garrick did not even appear to notice, Selina seemed quite distracted, yet she continued to focus on Garrick, and just as their intimacy reached its crescendo, she passionately kissed him, before snapping his neck and then lying back when his cannon sounded just a second later. Selina breathed out in exhaustion, whilst most viewers in Snow Square were shocked, but Eugenia stated that at least Garrick had received his final wish of a memorable death, and when Ennius had stopped laughing, he mentioned that this was probably one of the best ways to go. Allegedly, during this commentary, Selina was rudely shouting to viewers, asking if they had enjoyed watching this, and then trying to shame them for enjoying the games, although fortunately, this was not shown on Capital TV. Over the next few minutes, Selina quickly dressed herself in her clothes and body armour, then packed her supplies and left, just as Garrick's body was being lifted by the hovercraft. As it left the arena, Selina watched in apparent sorrow, but proceeded to march to the west for the next hour, eventually settling approximately halfway between the cornucopia and the southern perimeter. She did not even attempt to sleep, but instead simply faced to the north, whilst Lazarus slept within the supplies at the back of the cornucopia, the entrance of which he had covered in the tripwire once again. Horn of Plenty played approximately an hour after Selina had settled, and the portraits of Litz and Radia, both from 3, Marinella from 4, Phoenix from 6, and Garrick from 7 were shown in the sky, which left only Lazarus and Selina, both from 2, remaining. There was allegedly much debate in the control room that night surrounding the end of the games, with some suggesting that with only two tributes remaining, the showdown should be triggered there and then. However, gamemaker Breen insisted that they wait until morning, when most capital viewers would be awake, and the daylight would allow the showdown to be seen more clearly. Therefore, when Lazarus was stirring during the next morning's sunrise, gamemaker Breen made an announcement to the arena, in which he congratulated Lazarus and Selina for having reached this stage of the games, before stating that any tribute who was not in the cornucopia clearing in ten minutes would have their tracker detonated. Before Gamemaker Breen had even finished this announcement, Selina was already sprinting back to the cornucopia, with only her bow and three arrows at the ready. Meanwhile, Lazarus quickly pulled down the wires and walked into the centre of the clearing, although Eugenia commented as he walked that he appeared to have sprained his ankle during his fight with Phoenix the day before. Selina continued running north, occasionally tripping and panicking as she watched the dome timer silently counting down in the sky above. During this time, Lazarus attempted to climb onto the roof of the cornucopia, but this appeared to make him wince in pain when he tried to climb with his right leg, and so he remained back on the ground, where he continued to circle the structure, 
whilst looking for Selina, who he was clearly expecting to see at any second. Seconds after the timer had reached one minute of remaining time, Selina suddenly reached the southern edge of the clearing, but instead of running straight inwards, she watched carefully, until she saw Lazarus pacing past the mouth of the cornucopia and looking at all angles. Yet just as Selina suddenly ducked behind a tree, she appeared to realise that he had just spotted her. Lazarus walked with a smile through the south of the clearing as the dome timer passed 40 seconds. Selina breathed out in a panic and swiftly ran west through the forest before hiding behind another tree. Lazarus then entered the forest only five metres to Selina's north as she hid in silence. Selina looked up through the tops of the trees and she appeared able to see that the dome timer had just passed 25 seconds as she winced and carefully pulled off a loose branch from the nearest tree whilst Lazarus carefully walked south through the forest just metres to Selina's east. Fortunately for Selina, the branch did not make a loud sound as she detached it from the tree. After a few seconds, she threw it to the south with as much force as she appeared to possess, causing a loud cracking as it hit another tree. Lazarus then grinned and licked his lips as he readied his sword, before slowly heading south, while Selina very quietly travelled north on her tiptoes, towards the clearing as the dome timer passed through ten seconds. A second later, Selina suddenly sprinted north and practically jumped into the clearing, as she looked up to see six seconds remaining on the dome timer. Lazarus had been enthusiastically heading towards the sound of the branch that Selina had just triggered, but he then appeared to hear her running behind him. At that infamous moment, Lazarus suddenly appeared to remember the conditions of Game Maker Breen's announcement, and he looked up through the trees to see the dome timer hitting four seconds. He swore and sprinted north, back towards the clearing, but quickly fell on his injured ankle. Lazarus was then seen through the trees by Selina, writhing and yelling in pain, while she laughed in a loud and callous manner. The tracker in Lazarus' arm subsequently detonated, and he screamed in pain as his left arm was blown off. Selina then watched pensively, as Lazarus began to bleed heavily whilst his body convulsed. During this showdown, the sound in Snow Square was allegedly deafening, and Ennius had been shouting at Lazarus to get out of there. However, he was now so angry with what had just happened that he stormed out of the commentator's box, leaving Eugenia on her own, and like many, she was clearly in shock, but ever the professional, she spoke out loud to nobody in particular about whether Selina would do the honourable thing and shoot Lazarus. Eugenia's question was answered a few seconds later, when Selina readied her bow with an arrow, and without another word, she shot Lazarus in the head. His cannon sounded, and Game Maker Breen announced that Selina Brax of District 2 was the victor of the 99th Hunger Games. Selina proceeded to sit down, then lie on her back, and with no expression on her face, she glided her fingers across the grass around her. As the hovercraft entered, Selina still did not move and the death claw had to be used in order to remove her from the arena. Over the next two days, Selina rested in her apartment, as was the custom for most victors of this era. However, Rubia Stolton only came to see her during this time in order to perform the basic mandatory health checks that were expected of mentors. Selina spent most of these two days with her stylist, Ariadne Fling, who designed her a sparkling golden gown for the upcoming Victor's interview. Ariadne claimed that she was allergic to a cleaning product that had been used in the apartment, and she therefore insisted on creating this dress on the balcony, which led to most of their conversations during this time not being heard, due to the lack of audio on the balcony cameras. The Victor's interview occurred on the evening of the second day, and like last year, Aeneas joined Eugenia in asking the questions. As usual, the games were reviewed, and the interview seemed to be going smoothly, although a noticeable tension was apparent between Ennius and Selina, but Eugenia used her usual good cheer to keep things moving in a sensible direction. However, Eugenia was unable to react in time when Selina made a comment about Lazarus being an overgrown child, to which Ennius replied that Selina had let down the Dalton elite, firstly for killing Lazarus in such a cowardly manner, and secondly for showing emotional weakness throughout the games. Yet through the uncomfortable laughter of the audience, Eugenia jokingly told them both to behave themselves, and that this was a happy occasion. She swiftly changed the subject in order to review each death within the games, and although the interview appeared to continue normally, it was later noticed that Selina glared at Ennius when he made certain comments about her sensitivity to killing other tributes. When Garrick's death was shown, wolf whistling was heard from the audience, and Eugenia joked that this was an iconic death indeed, 
but Selina looked down and away, clearly trying to avoid even hearing the screen above. Aeneas laughed and stated that this had actually been quite a fun one, and that he hoped he would die like this. Yet Selina looked up at him and replied, you won't, which made Aeneas look back at her and raise his eyebrows in bewilderment. It was then that Selina pulled what appeared to be a clip from her hair, which was later revealed to be a small knife. She then lunged towards Aeneas, and before he could even attempt to defend himself, Selina had stabbed him in the neck. Chaos instantly erupted on the stage, as Aeneas collapsed to his knees and grabbed onto his neck that was now spurting blood, while Selina let out a menacing grin and turned towards the cameras at the front of the stage. Many of the audience members understandably screamed, and some tried to run into the aisles and out of the studio, whilst Eugenia screamed and sprinted away towards the back of the stage, past the peacekeepers that were now running in to subdue Selina. She was now standing in her bloodied golden dress at the front of the stage, and glaring into the camera. Before the peacekeepers had even reached Selina, she held her three middle fingers together and kissed them, then lifted them into the air. A second later, she slit her throat with the knife in the other hand, as the screams from the audience raged on. As Selina was falling to the floor, the transmission on Capital TV was cut. According to those present, the peacekeepers attempted to quash the hysteria that was flowing through the audience, by ordering everyone to sit back down and remain calm, whilst medics rushed onto the stage in order to try to resuscitate Ennius. During this time, Rubius was located within the audience, although he was understandably in shock at what he had just seen. He was quickly asked how Selina could have accessed this knife, but he responded that it could have only come from Ariadne Fling. The peacekeepers quickly searched for Ariadne within the audience. Although she had entered the studio at the start of the interviews, it soon emerged that she had apparently never taken her seat, and it was later shown on camera footage outside the studio that she had snuck out from a bathroom window before the interview began. She was then driven by Zarillo, her AVOX driver, back to the accommodation tower. The camera footage within the tower was cut shortly after Ariadne and Zarillo arrived, but it is unknown how this was achieved. Approximately 20 minutes later, footage from a neighbouring tower showed Ariadne, Zarillo, and 11 other AVOXs reaching the roof of the accommodation tower, where they were picked up a minute later by a hovercraft, which proceeded to fly away to the east. It is alleged that Maxima Liu and Chief Javorski, victors of the 79th and 87th Hunger Games, who were known to be in the tower at the time, enabled this escape, but due to the lack of footage in the building, it was never proven, and the pair were therefore unable to be punished. However, all the other AVOXs who were in the tower were subsequently executed for their potential involvement in this escape. It later emerged that Catalonian and Valencian spies within the capital had hijacked the hovercraft, which they used to transport Ariadne and the AVOXs from the accommodation tower, before flying across Panem and the Atlantic seas, all the way to the Valencian community in Europe, although it is unknown what happened to this group once they landed. A later investigation revealed that Ariadne was a member of a sleeper cell in a multinational European terrorist network, Unidad, by which she had apparently been indoctrinated when she had travelled within Europe ten years before, at the age of 19. Although many who knew Ariadne were shocked by this news, some former friends stated that her use of European languages during everyday conversation now made sense, with a member of her stylist team even hypothesising that Ariadne would use these languages to signal her involvement in this network and relay information regarding Panem's war against the European nations. This investigation even identifies several other members of Unidad within and beyond Ariadne's social circles, all of whom were swiftly executed by the capital. All references to languages, flags or symbols that belonged to foreign nations were subsequently criminalised by President Gaul. Aeneas unfortunately died within an hour of being stabbed, despite the best efforts of capital medics to revive him. A golden statue of his body was constructed outside the studio, which was subsequently renamed the Dalton Studio, and his nephew, Rubius Dalton, took over in his uncle's role as commentator. Within a week of the interview, game maker Breen and her husband, Ludovic, were shot and killed in their apartment during a robbery that was believed to have turned violent, yet fortunately their three-month-old daughter, Cordelia, was left unharmed. Due to the controversial legacy left by the 99th Hunger Games, they were never again shown on Capital TV, and possession of the tapes for these games was immediately criminalised. In fact, we only have accounts of these games thanks to a Capital family that escaped from the city, with a small amount of possessions that included a tape of these games. 
It was then passed down between generations in our land, and generously donated to the Gaul Library, which has allowed us to include it in these records.